Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. We are joined today by Charles Kenny, who is an English-American economist and senior fellow at the Centre for Global Development. He's the author of several books, including Overselling the Web, Development and the Internet, The Upside of Down, Why the Rise of the Rest is Good for the West. But we're going to talk today about his book, Getting Better, Why Global Development is Succeeding and How We Can Improve the World Even More. In the book, he argues that despite the claims that global development has failed due to the income gap between developed and developing nations growing, foreign aid is, on the contrary, a powerful and effective tool to build broader global quality of life, that aid money can and does work, it improves people's lives and makes the world a better and safer place. Hello, Charles. Welcome to the Middleway Society podcast. Hi, and thanks for having me. Okay, well, could you begin by telling us a little bit about your background, how you got involved with this field of work, and why you chose to write the book? Um, well, thanks. I was born born and bred in, in Britain, um, and then moved to the States for graduate school about 20-some-odd years ago. And from there, I got a job in the World Bank doing various different things. But uh, uh, one of the things that I worked on uh, 15, 20 years ago was the subject of economic growth in the developing world and you know what caused it and what was it looking like. And back then, that was a fairly depressing topic. Uh, we were in the lost decade of the 80s, uh, as, as it's still remembered, a time when um, a lot of countries were actually seeing negative income growth. And it was all a bit of a depressing story. But one of the things I noticed looking closely at the data was that while the story around income was indeed not so positive, we were seeing really quite positive, really historically unprecedented progress in areas like health and education. Yeah. More and more kids were going to school. More and more uh, uh, kids were surviving uh, youth and you know living to old age. And that excited me. Um, after all, the, the, we have income for a reason, right? We have in income in order to make our lives better. And here was evidence that actually lives were getting better. And I thought that was an important story. Um, uh, that the world is getting better in all of these various different ways, I think not only is you know good news, but also suggests that we can keep on making it better, that, that, that progress is possible and that we ought to be trying harder uh, to make sure progress continues to happen. Sure. OK. In many ways, your book, Charles, is about nothing adverse happening. Is that, <laughs> is that sometimes a hard concept to sell? It is. Um, I mentioned sort of in the start that, uh, you know, basically this book is about kids sort of waking up in the morning, getting dressed, having breakfast, going to school, coming back home, talking to their parents about their day, going to bed, doing the same thing the next day. Right. Um, this is not the stuff of Tolstoy. Uh, it is a hard story to make exciting. It is nonetheless the most exciting story there is. You know, the fact the fact that, that fewer and fewer people are suffering from violence or malnutrition, uh, the fewer and fewer kids are being forced to work in the fields, fewer and fewer people are suffering immense human rights abuses is a fantastic story. Yeah. I should add, though, of course, and, and anybody who turns on the news ever uh, will realize that there is an immense amount of pain and suffering still in the world. And I think you know, why it's important to realize that there's less is because of the immense pain and suffering there still is. We, we, we can do something about that pain and suffering. We have reduced it. It's not just you know, the status of mankind, the, the eternal uh, uh, way of things. We can reduce the pain and suffering we see, and so we should. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe we should, as a, as a way in, have a look at some of these improvements then. I mean, as a general yardstick, maybe we could go through the the Millennium Goals that were set mm. in 2000, see how we're measuring up there. So the, the first one was er, um, eradicating poverty and hunger. How are we, how are we getting on there? So the when I wrote Getting Better, one of the bits of the book was saying, you know, basically the story is positive, but actually on income we've seen global divergence. That means poor countries were growing slower than rich countries were. So rich countries were getting further and further ahead. Actually, during the period of Millennium Development Goals, we've seen that switch around. Um, uh, we've seen poverty drop dramatically in the 1970s, give or take about 60, 65 percent of the world lived on less than $1.25 a day. The most recent numbers suggest we're getting 
to below 10 percent. So over that long period, that's longer than the MDG period. But over that long period, we've seen, you know, from more than half to about one in 10 living in extreme poverty during the period of the MDGs. Global poverty more than halved. Most of that was China, but but not just uh, uh, the Chinese economic miracle. We've seen it other places. So really fantastic news on that one. The news on nutrition, um, a little bit more murky, to be honest, partially because we measure nutrition so badly, but still, you know, probably around a halving. So so really, in you know, in, in a pretty short period, some fairly dramatic progress. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, OK, the next one, universal primary education. So. There are actually more people in primary school now than there are primary age kids worldwide. The reason that's possible is there are some people who are sort of catching up. They're, they're older than primary age, but they're still in primary school. There are actually still um, millions of kids out of school, but we have seen really rapid progress again in getting almost every kid worldwide into primary school. We, we've got to do better, especially in, in situations of conflict, to make sure that kids can still get to school. But again, real progress. I would say the problem I have with, with our progress in education um, is that we've got a lot better at getting kids into school. We still have a challenge when it comes to making sure they learn something when they're there. Right. There are uh, various surveys of kids in the fifth and sixth and seventh uh, year of school and you know can they can they read a basic story which they certainly ought to be able to do by that time and and around the world you know sometimes you get a third of kids who can't do that after uh, five or six or seven years of school so we've still got a long way to go in making sure that schooling turns into learning but at least we've we've done nearly all of the schooling challenge yeah so you got you've we've got them in the building yeah okay next one promoting gender equality how, how are we doing there well, so the measure uh, in the MDGs was was on uh, girls to boys uh, ratio of girls to boys in school, or at least one of them was that. And and there we, we're doing very well almost everywhere. I and mean, we're doing very well in rather surprising places. So if you look at the Middle East, for example, not usually thought of as a hotbed of feminism, um, uh, there are actually more women in, in tertiary education, in, in university, than there are men. And it is a sign of progress, but it is also a sign that this isn't the be-all and end-all of gender equality. Nobody would say Saudi Arabia had gender equality, right? Um, so... Uh, again, we've seen progress. That's not to say we don't still have a lot, lot to achieve. OK. Child mortality? Uh, way more than halved. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we quite met the MDG. I haven't looked at the, the most uh, recent statistics, but way more than halved between 1990 and 2015. Again, sort of historically unprecedented progress. And it's really important to, you know, these, these sort of numbers, you, you throw them out, they're just statistics. It's really important to think about what that means. Yeah. When we're talking about child mortality, we are talking about parents having to bury their child, right? They, yeah. they're, 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 they're five-year-old kid. They are burying that child. The number of parents going through that experience is about nine million less a year than it was uh, 10, 15 years ago. We've seen immense progress. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of unnecessary suffering going away. Again, there are still nine million ish kids still dying every year before their fifth birthday. We need to deal with that challenge. Um, but we are making immense, historically unprecedented progress. And it really means something, you know, in terms of tears shed, it really means something no, big. No, it's it's very powerful stuff, this. Maternal health. What about that? I should know the statistics off the back of my head, um, and I'm not sure I do. That we didn't meet the Millennium Development Goal. Maternal health is a, still a real challenge. Um, uh, I think it was a two-thirds reduction in the MDGs, and, and we did not manage that. Um, I'll have to say, I have to say though, we think we didn't manage it. The data is so bad that uh, we'll never really be able to say uh, how bad maternal mortality was in 1990 at the start of the MDGs. We've seen progress. We've definitely seen progress. There are thousands fewer women dying a year in childbirth than there were uh, in 1990. But again, you know, we need to see more. OK. Why do you think the progress has been slower on that front? It's harder. Um, it's a harder challenge in some ways than child mortality. Um, a lot of the reductions in child mortality have been through vaccinations and antibiotics, both of which have, uh, I mean, it's not simple to vaccinate everybody uh, in the country at all, but um, it's a reasonably simple technology. You don't need doctors with sterile hospitals and so on. Maternal mortality uh, sometimes really does, reducing maternal mortality sometimes really does take, uh, you know, doctors or at least very well-trained midwives and, and hospitals with sterile equipment and um, so on. And, and that's something that a lot of developing countries don't have yet. So it is, it's a bigger challenge. It's still, it's not such a big challenge that we can't make 
faster progress than we have uh, on it, but it is it is a more complicated challenge. Okay, and then how are we doing on disease, things like HIV and malaria? So we've we've seen um, a peak in the number of people dying from HIV uh, AIDS uh, in the last few years. Now, that means still a lot of people are dying and uh, there's a long way to go. But I have to say one of the most amazing transformations of the last 10 to 15 years globally is from AIDS being just a death sentence, you know, you know, you're going to live five, six, seven more years, but you're going to die yeah. uh, to something that that, you know, even in quite poor parts of Africa, you can now live with AIDS. Um, and that I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the role of donors and, and aid later on. But but the the story of AIDS is one that you can't tell without talking about a huge international response to try and um, turn this death sentence into something uh, less bad. And I think it's been um, uh, a big success, which is not to say, again, that there isn't a huge way to go. We need to get down um, uh, rates of infection um, and, and we need to uh, roll out further uh, access to antiretroviral drugs. But we've, we've, we've really turned this thing around. It was started to turn it around from, from a, a growing uh pandemic that was was going to kill you know not just millions but tens of millions to something that's at least somewhat under control and and as i say the the number of deaths a year are are, are dropping is there a, a wider awareness as well i mean often there was a a lot of countries were almost in denial about it uh, yeah actually i mean one of the other places and this isn't in the mdgs but one of the places we've seen um, a really dramatic change, and it might come as a surprise given the, the news, newspapers, is is in um, acceptance of homosexuality worldwide. So if you – the World Values Survey goes around and it asks people a whole bunch of questions about their beliefs and, and, and uh, 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 you know, what do they think about democracy versus uh, other systems of government and uh, what do they think about the role of women in society. One of their questions is, um, uh, would you feel comfortable living in a house next to a homosexual couple? And it has seen dramatic change over the last 20 years. The number of people saying, no, no, no I could never live uh, next to a homosexual couple has, has, has dropped, not just in the United States and Europe, but worldwide at really quite a, a dramatic rate. So you see in the newspaper these terrible, terrible stories about the laws they're passing in, in some African countries, um, you know, banning homosexuality. And those laws are awful and, and, and I hope they go away. But to some extent, you've got to see that as a reaction against very rapid social change, uh, uh, you know, people are getting more and more, uh, people in general are getting more and more comfortable about homosexuality. And it's, you know, there's a reaction from the old guard, if you will, against that. Um, um, so I'm not saying it's, you know, the the the, the gray, gray lining of a silver cloud. It's it's not that good. But uh, uh, it, it is, um, the, the trend is so strong and so fast in the right direction on this one that I really think those those laws will go away soon, as well they should. And that has been um, a huge help to dealing with you know, that component of the AIDS crisis. Now, in developing countries, frankly, um, AIDS is not really an issue of, of homosexuality. It, it has been classed that way by by some of these bigots. Uh, actually, the vast majority of people with, with AIDS in the developing world uh, are, are heterosexual. So, yeah. you know, um, it, it was always a bit of a red herring, but it's a, it's a red herring that's going away. Oh, again, really encouraging, Charles. Okay, the next one is one that we're more cautious about, environmental sustainability. I, I would indeed be a bit more cautious about that. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the Paris climate uh, talks were were better than what we've seen in the past, but uh, everybody admits that you know that they're not enough to uh, get us on a a two degree path. We're yeah. seeing uh, bleaching of, of coral. We're seeing still uh, losses in biodiversity. I I do think this is a real issue. In my uh, optimistic moment, in my optimistic moments, um, I, I think we've shown that we can quite rapidly reduce carbon dioxide output if we put our mind to it, that it is not a hugely expensive problem. It may take a bit more technology change, but not 
creating new technologies out of thin air, taking things that are already in the laboratory and, and putting them in the real world is what we're talking about there. Um, and, you know, we've already seen in the UK, for example, peak stuff, uh, you know, the sort of the weight of, of, of output is going down in, in, in the UK. So there are some encouraging trends there. They're not at the moment fast enough to, to, to tackle our, our global environmental problems. Um, but, you know, if we can speed those positive trends up, um, I think we can get to a place where the whole world enjoys a decent standard of living and yet we live within planetary boundaries. Sure. I suppose my concern there is that, um, you know, I think things are getting a lot. Uh, one of the pluses of capitalism, you could argue, is that it may, makes things more efficient. You know, cars are a lot more efficient than they were 30 years ago. But it's in many instances, scale is far outpacing efficiency. I, I, I think you know, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. I, I'm um, always worried when people say, well, we've got to put a cap on consumption. I mean, in some ways, um, if you think of a sustainability problem, uh, it is a problem of the rich, right? Uh, if another Tanzanian baby is born, its impact on, on global sustainability is, you know, one iota uh, of, of the impact of a rich person getting a fifty thousand pound raise uh, uh, from 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 the work they do in banking. Um, you know, th this is a challenge for us in the rich world uh, to deal with, not not a challenge for uh, poor people in in the developing world to deal sure, with. Yeah. Yeah. That said, you know, uh, I, um, I, I accept that, that you know, um, um, in rich countries, um, there there may be such a thing as, as too much of a good thing. I, I'm an optimist enough to think that that technology can really help uh, it, it bridge that gap. I would say that um, it hasn't yet managed that uh, and and it's going to take a fair amount of government to make sure it does. And and just to your point of, you know, uh, victory of capitalism, I I don't know. Some people have, uh, have viewed getting better as a, a right wing text. Um, I certainly don't see it as such, partially because in the book, I point out that one other thing that has gotten bigger and better than it's ever been before in the world is government. There is no country in the world that has a government with a, you know, with a that's smaller than sort of 20, 30 percent of GDP. The era, era of global success in delivering quality of life outcomes is an era of historically unprecedented government size. So, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that I think uh, uh, we need 100% government, um, um, but I would say th the evidence is pretty compelling uh, that part of the story of an improved quality of life is a reasonably large government. Yeah. Okay. And um, and that the last one of the Millennium Goals, Charles, was global partnership for development. Is that improving too? Mm, actually, well, the, uh, in defence of the UK. Uh, at least on the aid front, the UK, uh, um, you know, met 0.7 percent, which is one of the things that everybody took MDGA to be about. Um, I'm not hugely optimistic about the global partnership for development. I sit in a country where uh, aid flows are falling, but perhaps more importantly, you know, the discussion recently in this country around trade and migration um, around global environment has quite often been fairly toxic um, and I see um, aid as you know part of a broader package that we really need to get righter for developing countries we've done a fairly terrible job um, at making sure the lowest income countries have uh, fair and equal access to the global trading regime we've done a fairly terrible job of making sure that people in those countries can come to rich countries for education to live uh, or, or to you know start up a, a trading relationship um, um, back home we need to do more in all of these areas in order to make sure that we really continue to see uh, rapid progress and you know the picture at the moment isn't positive as again in the united kingdom uh, uh, that you know the recent discussion hasn't really been about reaching out and strengthening global ties it's been about receding back to our island state and yeah. and i think that's that's really sad and quite worrying yeah it's, it's a bit neck and neck at the moment but uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway as we talked about at the beginning that the income gap is, is getting wider between developed and developing nations in fact significantly so so therefore as you say it's not money that's bringing about these changes so could we just go into a bit more depth what is 
NFTs. So I, I should say that the, the last 10, 15 years, uh, those trends have reversed. So oh, God, you um, did that say way, that, yeah. Yeah, the, the book is a, a little bit out of date, but uh, on, on, on that issue. In its defense, uh, in a, a broader scheme of things, if you look over a 50, 100 year period, it is still true that there has been huge divergence in incomes, even though the last 10, 15 years have been better. Um, so you're right. It can't really be income uh, in that many places are as poor as they've ever been. And yet they've still seen improvements in health and improvements in education. Um, I think I mentioned uh, 12 or so countries in the book which are poorer than they were in 1960. And yet you still seen infant mortality halve and so on. So I think it depends what we're talking about. When it comes to health, I think a really important part of it is some very, very simple and very cheap technologies um, like vaccination. Um, you know, smallpox killed hundreds of millions in, in, in the last century. Hopefully this century, smallpox will kill no one. Uh, hopefully polio will kill no one in this, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, after another year or two. Uh, oral rehydration salts. So that's just a, a package of sugar and salt dumped even into dirty water that you drink. It stops you dying of diarrhea, which is something yeah. that I'll a lot of people still do around the world. Um, so these really simple technologies are, are, are saving millions and millions of lives a year. With education, uh, I think it's it's partially about governments making sure that there are schools vaguely near most kids. Uh, it is also and crucially about parents making the decision that it's worth sending their kids to school rather than having them work in the fields. That's been a particularly uh, momentous change for girls. Um, th there was a period when you, know, you sent your boy to school because you're hoping he would go off and, 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 and make money in the city and you keep the girl at home. And now almost everywhere, uh, the assumption is you, you send the girl to school too, which I think is uh, uh, fantastic progress. Uh, again, I look at sort of changing norms when it comes to things like declining rates of violence and improved democracy. Just sort of the idea that you should get to vote for who runs your country didn't used to be a, a global norm, and I think now really, really, really is, and that makes a difference. It doesn't mean everywhere is a perfect democracy, far from it, but you know, it, it means we're, we're trending in that direction, if you will. So I think when you combine kind of norms and attitudes and technologies, that helps explain uh, a, a lot of the story as to why we're seeing this progress. But I will say, um, you know, governments and the international community um, uh, play play a big role here too. Um, if you look at vaccination rates in the developing world back in the 70s, they were, you know, things like measles and, and diphtheria and pertussis and, and tetanus and so on. 5% in, in of kids in the, in the poorest countries were, were getting vaccinated. Now we're up to 90, 95%. A lot of those vaccines are paid for by aid. Wow, it's amazing. Just, just back to what you said about there are a lot more girls in primary education. Uh, obviously, the government plays a big part, but are there, are there cultural reasons for that as well? I do think we've seen a lot of cultural change. Um, um, I think... Uh, you mentioned a, soap operas. Um, I, 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 that has been one, one force driving it. Um, the biggest way of predicting whether a girl is going to be in school is whether her mother was in school. So it's something that, that, that to some extent is generational, but you can speed it up. Um, and one thing uh, uh, I'm a big fan of is... is television uh, as a force to, to speed it up. Not that TV is always good, but um, uh, if you look at both India and Brazil, uh, as TV signals rolled out across the country, um, people started watching a lot of soap operas, just like they do everywhere else. Uh, these soap operas were written by you know, writers who tended to have if you will, socially forward views. Um, and so uh, the soap operas had strong women leads in them who didn't have very many kids, who were educated, who were running businesses, so on and so forth. And um, apparently that instilled in the watchers a sense of, you know, well, hang on, if, if they can have that, why not me? Because as the television signal rolled out across the country, you saw the number of kids women were having uh, fell, uh, uh, the chances that girls were in school go up women reporting that they had more power to make decisions uh, in the home. So uh, they kind of you know, picked up on the on the on the TV signals, literally and, and metaphorically, uh, and, and changed attitudes. And do you think television has also played a part in the world becoming less homophobic as well, like what we were talking about earlier? I, I think that is quite possible. Another another example that I think may be linked to TV is, is if you look at Dalits in India, the um, untouchables as they they used to be called um the the kind of lowest uh, caste surveys 
that Dalits themselves have conducted of attitudes towards Dalits in India suggest really dramatically reduced levels of discrimination over the last 20 years. So the chance that you get invited to a non-Dalit wedding has gone up. The chance that a non-Dalit will come to your home has gone up. All these different sort of indicators of social acceptability have, have really dramatically improved. And again, I think that may be TV. Um, you had a government in Delhi that was saying it was strongly in favour of these moves, plus a, a kind of a cultural, I hate to words use cultural elite, whatever, but, you know, a, a bunch of, uh, of people who, who wrote the TV shows and so on, um, who, who believed in that. And I think it, it does have an influence. Yeah. So, so then how do you think aid should be best directed, Charles? I mean, there's often this idea that aid is tie, also, also tied up with economic growth. Now, you challenge that to an extent, don't you? Or to a large extent? Well, so, um, again, since I've written the book, um, uh, a number of academic papers have come out saying that uh, probably my view in the book was a bit too negative on the role of uh, aid and economic growth. And there is actually more evidence than I, I mean, more evidence that there was when I wrote the book uh, that, that, that aid can actually uh, foster economic growth. I would still say uh, that the evidence that aid can have a dramatic, dramatic, dramatic impact on economic growth is limited. It's much stronger in areas like health. I don't think you can explain what happened to, as I say, vaccination rates, as it might be worldwide, without talking about aid. Um, yeah. It just financed most of those vaccines. And so there's clearly powerful evidence for the impact of aid in, in health and education. That doesn't mean it's the only thing that aid should do. But uh, uh, I do think, you know, if I was given an extra dollar of aid tomorrow, I'd probably be putting it uh, towards health and education just because we know we can have such a such a big and and transformative impact on lives. But what do you say to people? And there are quite a few in developed countries who say, you know, we need to put our own house in order f first before we help other people. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'd say I'd say two things. One is um, that. Our house is already comparatively uh, in, in much better order. For all the progress we've seen in the developing world, uh, there are still 10% of the planet living on less than $1.90 a day. That's the kind of thing that, you know, we spend at Starbucks without noticing. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the poverty line in the United States, which is a very low poverty line, is almost 10 times that, uh, almost 10 times $1.90 a day. So we're talking about really, really very poor people and 10% of the planet still living on that. Lots of kids are still dying for want of a simple antibiotic. Uh, lots of mothers are dying for, for want of a hospital bed uh, uh, when they give birth. In, in, in a whole bunch of areas, it's just hard for us to imagine the kind of life that is being lived still by 10% more of the world's population, even despite all of this progress. So one, our house comparatively is in pretty good order. Thank you very much. Um, other thing is, I, would, I don't see these things as mutually exclusive. Um, some of the best investments that a country like Britain or the United States can make is in making the developing world better off. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, I don't know what the statistic is for the United Kingdom, but in the United States, more than 50 percent of our exports go to developing countries. Richer developing countries are a massive source of, uh, of, of demand for our goods. Uh, richer developing countries produce stuff that we want. Uh, uh, you know, look where your iPhone comes from. They produce ne new technologies that we want. Uh, the mobile banking revolution is, is, is a story of the developing world developing a really useful technology that we're now picking up on. If you look at the Ebola crisis last year, we all suffer when people get sick in the developing world, especially from an infection. If, if there were stronger health systems in the developing world, we would save a lot of angst and even more money. Well, possibly a lot of money and even more angst, depending how angst ridden you are. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's a huge payoff. Um, so from just the point of view of, you know, uh, uh, of global health, of the global environment, um, of, of trading opportunities and investment opportunities and nice places to go on holiday, a richer developing, richer, healthier, happier developing world is really good for us. And, and aid, is, aid can help us get there. This, this is honestly an investment, not about charity. Sure. No. I mean, this is, as you said at the beginning, this is all really good news. But why don't we hear more about it? I mean, um, it's not out there, really. So I'd say two things. Well, one is, um, as you mentioned earlier, it's a 
it's it's a bit boring really it's mainly about stuff not happening it's hard it's hard to uh, uh make it into something that's newsworthy every day um, um because it's not a tragedy secondly i think um people rightly sort of focus on tragedies if you will um uh, because that's what we want to avoid uh and 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 it's uh you know what we want to run from if you will um and so news is is inevitably going to have um a bit of uh, a negative spin that's that's what sells um uh while there is a space definitely for positive stories out there and and you know sometimes they get retweeted lots and all over facebook as a rule it bleeds it leads sadly is a a, a good general rule for for newsmakers if they want coverage yeah. um so you know it's 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 a problem i guess about human nature if you will and i don't think it has to be an an, a, a, an insurmountable problem uh, um you know maybe maybe the news should mostly be about tragedy um um i just I'd, I'd ask for a bit of a rebalancing so going from you know 95 percent tragedy and five percent positive to maybe 70 30 uh and and i think that might help because i do think people are laboring under uh a false idea of how the world is if you survey people in Britain and ask them, is the world getting better or worse? 90% say it's getting worse. And yeah. I think that sets us up for thinking, well, why would we want to engage with the rest of the world? Let's, you know, hide behind the channel. It's all going to hell in a handbasket out there. It'd be much, much better to, to, to uh, uh, you know, build, build walls rather than go out and take a look. And so I, I do think it really matters um, if, the end result that that we all think everything is is going horribly wrong i i don't think it's plausible to imagine we're ever going to completely switch around the news media and everything in order to make it uh mostly positive but again if we could just if we could get some of the way there maybe it would help at least some more people uh, uh get the idea that actually things things are improving and so we ought to be looking out um, for opportunities to, to, to travel, to invest, to trade, uh, and, and the rest of it. Sure. I mean, um, as you say, that we, we, we sort of have this negativity bias. I mean, arguably, for much of our evolutionary history, it's been adaptive to be more receptive to negative information than positive. I mean, I mean we're more intensive... We're more attentive to the saber-toothed tiger being in that valley than the <laughs> strawberries in this one. But do you yeah. think that it's, it's also important to recognise that we that we have this bias? Maybe I mean maybe that's the the, the way uh, we deal with it. It's not that uh, you know we. we as, as you suggest, I, I too think it's 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 just innate to who we are. Um, so we're not going to change that. But being aware of that bias might help us. Um, more actively seek out positive stories yeah. that might help the news media media uh, more actively promote them and we would get to the 70 30 and that would be a better place to be yeah. okay well your, your book's been out how long now four or five years Charles yeah. so um, on reflection how has it been received and to what extent the hopes you had for the book have they been realized um it's been uh, fairly well received. Um, um, it, it has not sold like a Tom Clancy novel, but uh, didn't didn't really expect that. Um, I don't know how how much it ended up preaching to the converted, and and I, you know, I worry a bit about that. Um, some some um, people I hugely admire have said some very nice things about it, but of course, one of the reasons I hugely admire them uh, is because uh, they were already thinking what I said. Um, so uh, uh, I do I do worry uh, a bit that it hasn't necessarily you know changed a, a broader mindset. That said, there are some signs, and I, I you know the book, if anything, has played a very small role in that, if any role at all. There are some signs that various people, at least in the aid community, are changing the way that they are discussing things and telling stories. So I think it's fair to say that five, ten years ago, the model for fundraising was crisis driven. It's things are really, really terrible in the developing world. And so we need your money in order to help these people who apparently can't help themselves. And I think that's a, um, a, a successful way to raise money in the short term that has some toxic side effects, uh, which it is. It does suggest that you know, people in the, in the developing world are, are hopeless without us um, and, you know, feeds into a narrative that, that you, corrupt governments can achieve nothing in the developing world and they're all useless, um, probably does bad things when it comes to things like migration and, and trade and the acceptability of them. 
I think there has been a shift to attempts at least to tell a more positive story about progress and about how, look, we've seen Africa get uh, uh, vaccination rates up from you know 10 to, to, to 80 percent. Uh, let's get the last 20 percent of the way. Um, uh, and I think that is a much more positive message when it comes to broad engagement between rich and poor countries, I admit that I'm not sure it's a much more successful way of raising money in the short term. So it's, it, 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 I think it's a, it's a good thing overall. I admit it may come with with some cost to the to the bottom line in the short term for, for aid agencies, civil society organisations working in development. But I think it's a if there is a price, it's a price worth paying. Okay, just two more questions, Charles. Um, the middle way, as we understand it, is the idea that we, we make better judgments by avoiding fixed or dogmatic beliefs about things. That then arguably throws us back on, ex on experience, so we're left in this sort of messy, uncertain middle. But, it, but, but, it's, but it's in this messy, uncertain middle that we, we can maybe actually start to get to grips more adequately with the phenomena that we encounter, whatever they are. Now, how might that relate to what we've been talking to? about today do you think uh globalized global development is definitely messy uh um <laughs> so uh, there there has been a long debate in global global development about the you know the market versus government um as i say i think the evidence is pretty much you definitely need government for some stuff but i would also be very very happy to admit that the governments quite often um do terrible things um uh, uh you know beat up and, 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 and kill uh, their own civilians, but uh, citizens, but also sometimes well-intentioned uh, uh, government uh, investments and so on go horribly, horribly wrong and, and, and are a waste of money. Um, this is a place where, frankly, anybody who walks in with a strong ideology has to walk out the other side and realize, well, you know, clearly it's more complicated that it depends on circumstances. If they don't, they're, they're really just not looking. Um, so... Uh, while I've sort of laid out a, a reasonably simple picture of some of the things I, I think are behind progress in, in, in health and education, I'd be the first to admit they're more complicated. And again, while, while I, I sort of said in the book that I thought that the, the, the picture on income was clear, I, I think the picture on income has become more complicated yeah. uh, uh, since I wrote the book. So um, I, I certainly feel in the position that, that if you're not constantly learning, you're doing something wrong in this space. <laughs> Great. That's great. Great answer, uh, Charles. OK, and my last question. If, if people wanted to find out more about your work, how would they go about it? Um, well, I have a, a website, charleskenny.blogs.com. Uh, 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 I have um, I work at the Centre for Global Development, uh, which is cgdev.org. Uh, if you go there, there's, there's, there's a fair amount of my work. Um, if you go on Amazon, uh, <laughs> your local bookseller, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so, so some of my work is there. Um, and uh, I I really am keen to engage. So, uh, um, you know, happy, happy to uh uh, answer uh, questions and so on um, by whatever means makes sense uh, to, to, to people who are interested for more. Okay, well, that, well, thank you very much for talking to me today, Charles. It's been a pleasure and really interesting. Well, thank you too. It's been, it's been a lovely conversation. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www dot middlewaysociety dot org <laughs>